I'd like just to begin, uh, you have your notes in front of you, that we do live in a time uh, when one's feelings and intuition seems to be the most important and carry the most uh, authority in people's lives. Uh, both secular and in the church, it, it's progressing that way in the churches, where the authority does not seem to be God's word uh, overall in so many of the different churches. Uh, I was reading uh, David Wells, a church historian, who said it, the revolution really began back in the 1960s. He says in his book, The, the Courage to be Protestant, he said it was a time when the turn became inward to the self. He said this is at the heart of the postmodern rebellion. It turned away from meaning that is fixed and universal and turned toward meaning that is private and subjective. It shifted from absolute moral norms to those that are simply private. It rejected the Enlightenment's confidence in naturalistic reason and began to think more in terms of intuitions and to give greater weight to feelings. In this situation, he writes, it is the self, the empty, minimal, disintegrating, and autonomous postmodern self that must assume the center in life. It is the self and its intuitions from which we derive the only meaning we have in life. This means that the transcendent from which we once took our bearings, has been relocated within. The self must function as our transcendent norm. It is from within that we are left to read our own meaning. And he writes further on down, he says, Today we traffic in the illogical and irrational without skipping a beat or wincing. We do not trust the mind. We lean far more confidently on the emotions. And then it would explain a lot in our culture. It doesn't even matter about science uh, with gender issues uh, to so many people. It's how they feel. Even if they may feel gender fluid in the day, it could go to uh, either gender. But uh, my concern is more that the church right now, the typical evangelical church, there seems to be much confusion on the source of truth. What is really going to bring the authority and certainty uh, that we need? Uh, we need today a word from God, his holy scripture. And God has given us truth uh, that addresses all these subjects on gender, uh, sexuality, killing sin habits. But when God gave us truth, he gave us truth and descending levels of certainty and authority. And so God gave us first his revelation, the scriptures. It's 100% authoritative and 100% certain. And we start there and let God be true and every man be found a liar. But we're dealing with people, even in counseling situations, where the source of truth has flipped with authority and certainty. Instead of God's word being in their mind uh, what's certain and authoritative, it's their feelings and uh, their intuitions, uh, subjective uh, truth from within. It, it comes from within and is verified from within. And so uh, with the notes that you have, I'd like to begin, and I'm going to have to go quickly uh, with the notes that you have, the nine pages of notes. I want to start sort of like a crime scene investigation or dealing with sin and killing sin habits in this particular lecture. And I'd like to begin more up around the 30,000 uh, feet level, uh, and then we'll move down to sea level and how it applies into our, our life, uh, sort of uh, the euphemism where the rubber hits the road. Uh, but I'm going to go broad, and then we'll hone in on specific things and dealing with sin in the life of a Christian. So there in your notes, first of all, uh, letter A, the sin in the battle. I just invite you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I put several references there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 3 through 6, and where Apostle Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. And he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to, the, to obey Christ, and being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. We are in a, a spiritual war. It's not what we, we see so much as the enemy is what we don't see. And we deal with the world, uh, the flesh, and the devil. And so I, I have n- numerous uh, points underneath the major heading, Sin and the Battle, Uh, One book that I've just been recently rereading is Ralph Venning, the Puritan Ralph Venning, on the sinfulness of sin. And I would just encourage you, what a good uh, review of what God says in the Bible about sin and about God and his character. Uh, But I want to define a few things here. Sin defined, first of all, there it says, in answer to the question, what is sin? Uh, we could point to 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. Even in Titus chapter 2, uh, rehearsing the gospel, it says that Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession. So sin is breaking God's law, uh, whether omission or commission, even the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it this way, sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Now, where does this come from? Obviously, the scripture, but in a secular view, when they deny there is a God and any moral law, although I was talking to one unbeliever and uh, this unbeliever told me, well, I do believe in sin, but it's only when it's a crime a crime against someone or a group of people, then that, this person said, then I would think that would be a sin. But uh, typically, with no God in their mind, uh, or suppressing the truth about God in their minds, I should say, uh, they reject any moral laws. They blame society. Uh, society is to blame and how it's governed, or lack of education. Any problems they have in sexual issues, they try to Uh, bring sex education into the schools. So blaming society, blaming education, but the biblical view is it comes from the heart. I mean, sin began in heaven with Satan, but it began on earth with Adam, the first Adam of Romans 5, verses 12 uh, following. But the scripture teaches us that sin is rebellion against God, and it comes from within, from the inner man, the heart. The worshiping heart. Uh, Out of the heart flow the issues of life, and so we're to guard it with all diligence in Proverbs 4.23. And in Mark 7, verses 21 and following, Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, it's what comes out of his heart. And out of his heart come evil thoughts and fornications and adulteries and all kinds of sin. Uh, And you see that from Genesis 3 all the way to uh, Revelation 20. Major theme running through the scripture is the theme of sin and in God's grace and by his mercy, the theme of redemption. So that's uh, sort of origins. Uh, Number three there in your notes, where it leads to. For the unbeliever, uh, you have your Bible open to 2 Corinthians. If you go to Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to, speak, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. And then verse 3 uh, highlights how every unbeliever is and how we all once were if we are a believer now. Verse 3 says, For we ourselves were once foolish, That's how we were thinking and responding. We were disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. 
That's the condition of the unsaved. Uh, slaves to various passions and pleasures. The world would call that addictions, but slavery, it's, it's a worship of the heart that is enslaved to sin. So for the unbeliever, it's a hopeless slavery, and the best they can do in any kind of dealing with gender issues, sexuality issues, the best they can do, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever other theory uh, or therapy they use, the best they can do is move up a deck on the sinking Titanic. That is the best they can do. Uh, hopefully get their head out of water in one deck up to another deck. But the, the mankind, there is no hope apart from Christ, as we're told in Ephesians chapter 2. Now for the believer, letter B, there, number three, letter B, for the believer there can be a, a temporary entanglement a voluntary entanglement. Uh, the believer, uh, the power of sin uh, was destroyed at the cross of Christ and his resurrection, so we don't have to sin as Christians, those who have been regenerated and converted. But there is this entanglement. Uh, Hebrews 12 says, lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. And oftentimes in counseling, you're, we're either dealing with a sin issue or a trial, uh, some sort of a trial suffering or a sin problem. And we do find uh, believers who are entangled in various sins, and there's great help and hope uh, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then letter C, without mortification and vivification, two words that maybe you don't... Uh, don't hear much about, but mortif mortification, a killing of, a weakening of sin in one's life, and a reviving, a vivification, renewal, a sinful entanglement uh, becomes like clockwork. If, if we don't mortify sin and, and our revive our faith, uh, our sin becomes habitual, like a habit, like, like clockwork. And so I think probably one of the slides that you'll be watching now or looking at will be a slide of uh, a clock, and, and I'll just move it around. And after years and years of counseling and, and encouraging people, and even in working through issues in my own life, uh, early on with habits of sin, uh, it was just like clockwork, the, the habits, the entanglement. And so at uh, the 12 o'clock setting there on the clock that you're probably looking at on the PowerPoint, uh, time passes, you know, pressure builds, and there's a desire, a possible temptation, isolation, and provision. It's not a good setup when you have a sinful desire, or you want a good thing, but you want it way too much, so it's inordinate. You, you want something so much and you're alone, and there's provision for it. That, that is a slippery slope uh, towards sin. And uh, we move to the next uh, point of the uh, clockwork there, and the mindset is not on Christ or serving others, but on self. Anytime you have omission of Christ, uh, the disciplines of grace, when we're not thinking about the Lord or the things of the Lord, and we omit the spiritual disciplines of uh, Bible reading and prayer and meditation and fellowship and serving others, omission will lead to, to commission of sin. Uh, that, that is um, sort of standard operating procedure. You omit how we're supposed to grow in our faith, and we will commit sin. And so our mind is not on the Lord, and then like clockwork, you'll hear people say this, and, and then I started struggling with sin. I started struggling, and you ask, what were you thinking? And they'll tell you numerous rationalizations to justify why to give in to sin. Like, no one's perfect, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm alone, I'm single, I want to be married, but I'm not married, so that justifies me to sin in this way. 
uh, or uh, everyone else seems confused on the gender issues. And so that's why I, you'll just hear this, all kinds of thoughts. And that's the key point there is really looking in on what were they thinking? And then what were they wanting? And then what did they choose? So these feeble struggles. And then they'll say to themselves, I just can't win. And so they go, I'm... I've already lost the battle in my mind. I might as well give in to my, my flesh. And so they please themselves in some fashion, some way. And, and there is the decision uh, to sin. Um, we're drawn away by temptation. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. In James chapter 1. And so there's the decision. And in some ways, it's a process leading up to this. But there's the decision to sin. And whenever they sin, there's guilt. And then that sort of moves to a, a temporary pleasure that they get from the sin or the process leading up to the sin. There is some sort of a temporary pleasure, and we almost have to put that in quotes because it's not truly a God-ordained God righteous pleasure. It's a sinful pleasure. So it's the best it can be is sugar-coated poison. And then there's sorrow and shame, uh, immediately following that, and then possibly a delayed confession if they're a, a professing Christian. And they may get to the, the Lord or other people and say something like, I'm sorry, um, often a worldly sorrow, uh, not turning from sin, just saying uh, they sinned and that they're sorry about it. Uh, often provisions, the next point up, uh, provisions for lust, typically are not totally eliminated, but there's like break in case of emergency provisions from time to time. So they know where they can make provision. And they often, at the 11 o'clock hour there, they keep to themselves, uh, rarely tell anyone about the struggle they're having or that they want to repent and turn uh, to be more Christ-like. Uh, no outside help is often sought. And then time passes, pressure builds, and the, the, it's like clockwork, like habit, where we're doing it uh, automatically. Um, sometimes uh, just the desire, and they go, I went right to the deed, but there was a process that just speeds up, and that's the nature of habits. So I, I just found that helpful in talking to individuals. It's like this, right? And I describe that, and they go, yeah, it's just like that. Sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes on a weekly basis, it seems just like that. Now, what is um, exacerbating the problem? Uh, you're in Titus chapter 3 in your Bible. If you'll just go to chapter 2, uh, up to verse 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So even at the beginning in verse 11, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation. That's the greatest need in anyone's life is to be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, turning from sin and trusting in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So uh, in your notes there, what exacerbates the problem is when you have unbelievers who oftentimes think they're believers. Uh, you have Christianized pagans. And that'll definitely exacerbate the problem when you're talking to them and they say they're a believer, they profess faith, but there's no life that backs it up. They're not a believer. It's uh, Titus 1 uh, verse 16, which uh, says there, they profess to know God, talking about false teachers, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. So their profession of faith, their fruit, cancels out their profession. That'll definitely uh, make it more difficult and uh, impossible, uh, except if God were to save them and have mercy on them and save them. 
Secondly, another thing that exacerbates the, the battle that we have uh, with uh, um, sin and killing sin habits, and you have a diagram there, I think, on the PowerPoint that kind of walks through the major elements of the gospel. I, I would walk through that with a person. If they say they're a Christian, I do this with everybody that I counsel. Uh, I take a whole session and I just walk through uh, their understanding of God, man, sin, uh, the Savior, uh, what he accomplished on the cross and resurrection, what it means to believe uh, that you have the knowledge, you agree with the, the knowledge, and you turn from trusting in yourself and sinning to trust in Christ and obey him and trust him fully. And then there's also a warning for those who reject the gospel. So I walk through that gospel presentation uh, with individuals. And I, sometimes at the end, I just uh, tell them, I, I will take you at your profession of faith unless your habitual actions or attitudes deny your profession. But some other misconceptions that make the battle more difficult is how to grow and change. Uh, misconceptions about sanctification. I remember uh, buying two books on sanctification. Uh, five Views on Sanctification, Christian Spirituality, Five Views of sanctification. Altogether, five, two books on five views, there are seven views presented there in these two critical thinking books. That'll cause some confusion and make the battle more difficult. How are we supposed to deal with sin in our lives? Uh, I, uh, early on when God saved me, uh, he, he graced me with saving faith when I was 18 years of age in a uh, boarding school in Asheville, North Carolina. But I made numerous professions growing up, but I was not converted. I lived totally for myself. It was just a, an emotional high on a Friday night at a camp meeting. But it wasn't until I was 18 that God graced me with repentance and faith, and I turned from living for myself habitually to live for Christ. Not perfectly, but going in that direction for his advantage. And that was all by his grace and according to his mercy. But soon I was uh, at, at a school that taught uh, how to grow and change the sanctification process as just let go and let God. Uh, most know this uh, formally as Keswick theology. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew Nicelli's book. I think he's a graduate from your school, on his PhD work on the Keswick theology, what's wrong with it, and has condensed it into a book called No no quick fix. But misconceptions on sanctification, I was for years trying to just yield. I, Lord, here I am, uh, take away uh, the strong pool of sin in my life, take away my lusts. Uh, you, you do it. Uh, here I am. So it's let go and let God. And you won't grow that way. Uh, you'll grow in pride or self-righteousness, but you will not grow in holiness in that way. Uh, fundamentally, because God will not obey for you. Uh, the scripture is replete with exhortations that have you as the subject, not him. Uh, you mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. You encourage one another. You confess. You do all of these things. All the imperatives have you as the subject, not God. God is in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. He will help us. He will not obey for us. And so it was years of just struggling with uh, sin in my life. And others, uh, I think it's probably the most pop popularly held view of the seven views of sanctification in these two books. And most people don't even know the word Keswick uh, or the origin of it, but I think is most popular whenever I'm counseling people, what have you done about the sin problem in your life? And they say, I pray. And I ask, what do you pray? And they said, well, I pray that God will take it away. So it's a let go, let God uh, way of thinking, which uh, is not biblical sanctification. And you have a quote there at the end of the page uh, that sanctification is a progressive work that continues throughout our earthly lives. It's a work in which God and man cooperate, each playing distinct roles. Uh, very different than justification, but you don't want to separate the two. But sanctification is a cooperative effort. God's helping us. Even the Puritans uh, called it holy sweat. 
Uh, it's dependent work. Now, if you go to letter C, uh, a counterfeits to mortification. So I address a lot of these in the book, uh, Killing Sin Habits. And uh, some of you, I don't know if you have the book now, if you get the book later, but uh, Killing Sin Habits that my wife and I wrote together, uh, it has a picture of an axe and a uh, tr- like part of a tree stump. And it brings back memories of when my dad, we raised chickens early on when I was growing up, and my dad uh, would have um, us hold the chicken when he would come down with the axe and cut off the head. And uh, we, we ate it uh, that evening. But when I was little, I was about five years of age holding that chicken, and my dad came down with that axe and cut off the head of the chicken. Uh, I let go of the chicken because it scared me, him coming down with the axe. Uh, the next thing I knew, this headless bird was chasing me around the yard, uh, flapping its wings and scared me half to death. And um, a good reminder to us, it, the old man is dead. Uh, it's, it's headless. It, it's, it's dead. It was put to death uh, there at the cross, the resurrection. However, it's still moving around. And um, that's what we're dealing with. It's sort of like our sinful flesh is uh, much like today. That It's like a zombie. It's, a, it's the walking dead. Positionally, uh, we died uh, to sin in Christ, and we were raised to life. Uh, we are a new creature in Christ. But this flesh, this, this old nature still is uh, it's operative, although positionally it's dead. But some counterfeits there, some key examples of counterfeits to mortification. Uh, asceticism, uh, I, I talk about that in the book, and pietism, that, that's definitely on the rise, which experience is almost more important than uh, doctrine. Uh, my experience is more authoritative than doctrine, and if you are pietistic, it, uh, in the 17th century movement out of Germany. Then you have mysticism that is definitely on the rise uh, all over the world, but even in America, where uh, R.B. Kuyper, a theologian of, uh, oh, uh, boy, it's been uh, probably 100 years or so, R.B. Kuyper, he wrote, it's the essence of mysticism to separate the spirit from his holy word. And we have this people talking all the time about God apart from Scripture. God told me this, and God laid on my heart this, and you're taking God's name and you're putting it to, to experiences and promptings and various things, and it's a form of mysticism. It's separating the spirit from his word. If you want to hear God, we read it, his word or hear it preached, but once you leave scripture, there's no, uh, no way to know it's God and no safeguard from error when you leave the pages of his word. And one... Uh, theologian said it's a form of taking God's name in vain when you take God's name and you attach it to something that he does not specifically say he attaches it to it. And I would just say, I just had a thought. I just had a, a, um, a desire. I just wouldn't put God's name on it unless you can find chapter and verse for it. But there's a lot of this going on today, and that creates uh, confusion in the area of mortifying sin, growing in righteousness, uh, I already mentioned the Keswick movement. Uh, antinomianism, or the hyper-grace movement, is still alive and um, in some circles uh, being promoted. Even in the area of counseling, uh, people who are all into position and identity and not what position takes us to, and that is a practice of holiness. Or legalism. Uh, placing one's trust and confidence in some practice added uh, to Jesus' finished work. And now you get into legalism. There are some uh, distinguishing factors of when a sin is mortified and when it's not. And I discuss these in the book as well. But you know know a sin is uh, subdued, weakened in your life. And I took some of these... um, points here from distinguishing factors from John Owen 
in his work on conflict with sin, and Christopher Love in his book on the mortified Christian. Uh, they write these things. Uh, they say your carriage, uh, if your sin is not mortified, your carriage is parked outside the commission of it, which just means you have provision for your sin. You're not far from uh, provision to keep sinning. Uh, they also said very little prayer is prayed against it. Uh, you're more eager to commit it than to resist it. They also said your sin is not mortified when you can commit the sin on a very little temptation. They said your heart will be like gunpowder to sin's touch. And they write, you, can take, you tend to take more care in keeping your struggle with sin private and secret than seeking help. In Galatians 6.1, you know, when someone is overtaken in a sin, uh, you who are spiritual come around and help the person, but you can't help someone unless you know they're struggling with a sin and want to repent. And then they also write, you know a sin is mortified, and your faith is being revived when... Uh, there is much contemplating of God's perfections, his character, sort of the attribute studies. Uh, they also said, uh, you also react strongly against the first stirrings of sin. The first stirrings, uh, there was a phrase some years ago called nip it in the bud. As soon as the thought comes in, you do battle quickly. Now you know a sin is mortified when you go after it quickly. Also, when you are hating all sin, not just one sin. All too often I hear individuals, they just want one sin they're dealing with, rather than, I hate all sin. I love God and his holiness, and I hate all sin. I'm specifically trying to deal with this one issue in my life, but I hate all sin. And they said, uh, you know your, um, a sin is mortified, or sins are being mortified uh, when you live with a serious mindfulness of God's presence. You're just aware of uh, meditating on his truth throughout the day, and which is such a help. Now, letter B in your notes, the call of God to mortify sin in our lives. The call of God to mortify sin in our lives. I mean, this is a command to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was Peter's last words in 2 Peter 3.18. But we are called to grow. Uh, we are also told in Romans chapter 8, and that is in your notes, So then, brethren, we are under obli uh, obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For uh, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Romans 8, 12 and 13. So what is mortification defined? Again, we don't hear a lot about that word mortification, uh, putting to death of. And what it is there, and it's my attempt at a definition, uh, pulling from John Owen, Christopher Love, uh, Chris Lungard in his book, on the enemy within, and other articles as well. It's a discipline of grace whereby a Christian pursuing purity and resting on Christ's finished work on the cross, the key word here, aggressively strives against sin and the manifestations of the flesh in his life and thus weakens it so that its power and predominance is subdued and practically destroyed while at the same time aggressively strives towards a growing faith in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, two times, aggressively. You are aggressively putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Romans 13, 14. And you are aggressively making no provision for your flesh. Uh, if there's anything that you pick up from the various scriptures on putting sin to death, is that we do not coast into godliness. Uh, you won't coast into getting in shape uh, physically either. You won't coast into becoming skilled at any habit in your life. Uh, it takes discipline, and it's spirit-empowered discipline. 
It's by the Spirit. And it's just indispensable. Uh, They are number three in your notes there that uh, we need to bring God glory. And it's for our uh, eternal good as well. And this should be our goal. It's not just to defeat sin and grow in our faith in Christ so that we feel better, we have a, a better functioning life. It's that God is glorified. I like the saying, we are most satisfied when God is most glorified. Uh, It's more about his glory than about my happiness. Uh, We also find delight in him, but we are most satisfied when God is most glorified. So let us see, it's really a call to vivify. Again, that's a word we don't hear much of. Uh, The word vivify means to endue with life or to quicken, or revive, uh, bring to life something that's wilted, it's coming back to life, something that's neglected. Now there is digging and fertilizing, there is a lot of effort uh, to rejuvenate uh, our our faith in Jesus Christ. This, This call to grow in our faith and to exercise our faith and also to mortify sin in our life. This is not a 90-degree turn in our life. A 90-degree turn is someone who wants to break a habit. We're not talking about breaking habits. We are talking about replacing habits by the help of the Spirit of God for the glory of God. A 90-degree turn would be a support group where people sit around, they talk about a sin, and Uh, Did you sin last week? Did you give in to that? No, it's been three years, two months, one day since I last. That's a 90-degree turn. What God calls us to in vivifying our faith and mortifying sin is repentance and faith. It's a 180. It's a 180-degree turn. You don't want a 360. That's a recovery movement. That's going back the way you were, all the way around. You, You want to turn from sin, and you want to follow Christ and keeping your eyes focused on him. It's intentional. Again, we don't coast at this. We dare not be slothful. Romans 12, 11, don't be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Uh, There's just no room for laziness. That'll be one of the big enemies that we have. We think we can just uh, a 10-minute, 15-minute time in the Word in the morning, and it's like a time-release vitamin C capsule. Uh, That should just take me through the day. It won't. And we need to keep reading, meditating on Scripture, and praying throughout the day. Uh, Omission of those spiritual disciplines will lead to commission of sin. So vivification, uh, what's missing is critical. Uh, Number three there, we must vivify Christ. Uh, It it is setting our minds and focus on Jesus, uh, the author and perfecter of our faith. Uh, we 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 do not want to make faith our Savior. We want Christ as our Savior. It's faith in Christ. And so that's why in Romans 13, 14, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about sanctification. A positionally, who we are in Christ leads to a practice of keeping our eyes on him, The Spirit of God is helping us to keep in step with with himself, with the Spirit of God as he takes us towards Christ-likeness. So number three, when we must vivify Christ, the gospel of faith in our lives, uh, is true worship of Christ alone. Now if you'll turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2 I have found to be a very helpful picture of what we need to do and how we can get ourselves into entanglement, into habitual sin. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, he starts off with uh, reflecting back in chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1, where the Lord says, uh, even about Judah, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness and the land not sown. Uh, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. I mean, he's reflecting back the the early days, and now he's looking at where uh, Judah is at now before the Babylonian captivity. And what he says here 
in Jeremiah 2, he even calls the heavens to uh, be a witness to this. It's unbelievable what Judah has done. Of five, six hundred years of this. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, what I find interesting in that passage, and the, the cisterns that he's referring to is Egypt and Assyria. Uh, he, he mentions them in verse 18 and 19. But in other places in Scripture, cisterns were the false gods that uh, Israel, Judah, the Israelites would go uh, seeking after uh, false worship, false gods. But here it's referring to putting their confidence and trust in two nations rather than in the Lord. But what is interesting in verse 13 is he says, my people have committed two evils. Not just one. It's not, not just the evil of, of sinning in uh, drinking from broken cisterns. And you could compare killing sin habits to much like cisterns, uh, cistern groups, support groups. Uh, it's a, a group for sex addicts, a, a group for Alcoholics Anonymous, or there's a group for there's all these support groups. They're like cistern groups. And they're all sitting around saying, I, I, I haven't drank from that for so long, and I haven't tasted that, or I haven't committed a sin in that particular thing. That's focusing on evil number two. They're, they're committing evil number two because they committed evil number one. Evil number one in verse 13 was they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. We know from 1 Corinthians 10 that the, the rock in which Israel drank was Christ. So we could say they, they have forsaken Christ. They're, they're not focused on Jesus. They're, they're not focused on their God and finding contentment in him. Contentment would be Jesus plus nothing equals contentment. And so whenever they add, but, but I need, but I need, uh, Jesus isn't an enough, I need something else. They've committed evil number one by forsaking Christ. Now they've gone after a broken cistern that holds no water. Whether it's confidence that they have in someone else or a nation or a false god or some sin that they're involved in. That's why support groups don't work. Uh, they, if anything, you're, again, you're just up one deck on the Titanic. It, it, the, the solution is not breaking habits in Scripture. It's replacing them by the Spirit of God using His Word for the glory of God in the context of local church of other believers helping you. Uh, I'm indebted to so much of uh, reading from uh, saints of long ago as well, just supplemental uh, as I, and they flesh out the truths found in Scripture. That there seems to be a, a progression. Uh, this is number three, the third bullet point. There seems to be a progression. What, oftentimes what we're after in our own lives and when we're ministering to people is just helping people trust and obey with delight. I just really want you to trust God and obey Him. I want to trust God and obey Him. But that's the end of a process. You just don't get there. Uh, you, just, you can command it, because the Bible commands us to trust and obey. But it, it's slow going. It's, uh, people wrestle with that. They're, why? I, I, we don't trust people we don't know. If I don't know the Lord, I'm not going to trust them that well. And so it's a progression. And I, again, I'm appreciative uh, of individuals like uh, Stephen Charnock and George Swinnick and Richard Baxter, Thomas Watson and others, Stephen Yule, uh, a more contemporary Stephen Yule. But it starts with knowing and understanding God. That's, that's where you need to help people come to is do you not know who I am, the Lord would say. In Jeremiah, the same 
uh, just a couple pages away in chapter 9. This is what the, the Lord says. He says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So he's telling us, and he says, you've forsaken me, but what he delights in is get to know him and understand him. Which then takes us, we progress from there. We get to uh, studying his attributes, his perfections, both uh, communicable attributes, his incommunicable attributes, uh, and then uh, from knowing and understanding, it, it moves to a, a reverence of God, a fear of God. Uh, he's high and lifted up, and we bow low. As the psalmist said in Psalm 99, he said, I exalt the Lord, exalt the Lord, and worship at his footstool, for holy is he. Uh, he's, he's majestic, and so we bow low. And you know, that's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And there's no fear of God in our land today. And so there's no wisdom. And we have fools uh, spouting things off, whether it's in politics uh, uh, or in the public sector. Um, they have no knowledge of God, and they don't understand God. So there's no reverence of God and therefore foolishness. But when we are seeing God and is, he's high and lifted up, there's a reverence for him, uh, we see uh, both uh, his holiness and his majesty. We also see his goodness and what he has done. We see who we are in his presence, and we're amazed. We're amazed next. The next point is the love of God. Uh, we love God. Look what he has done for us because he first loved us. When you have that going on in your life, a steady, aggressive diet, a pursuit of knowing and understanding him, a reverence of him, going to a love of God, guess what will happen? Well, what, you won't be committing evil number two. You won't be going to broken cisterns. It's a greater love now. And, and, and it just takes us to the Lord, and we will trust and obey him and find delight in doing so and enjoying him forever. So hopefully that is helpful uh, that diagram there, uh, as you think about the whole issue of killing sin habits uh, as we exercise our faith in Christ. Now, very quickly, I'm just going to, like skipping a rock on water, uh, touch on a couple of points here and uh, get to sea level on what kinds of things can we practice and do. Uh, there in your notes uh, on letter uh, B, it says, vivify the gospel truths of Christ daily. Just continually thinking through our position in Christ, as well as what that leads to practice. And in the footnote there, I listed several uh, gospel-oriented truths, truths about Christ that affect us, uh, that uh, we are involved in and what he's done for us. Uh, for example, um, Christ is the maker and Lord of all creation, the fountain of living water. I'm forgiven, and, and I have an advocate in heaven. Uh, I am eternally justified and adopted through Christ's substitutionary of death. I'm indwelt with all the power of the Holy Spirit in Christ because of the cross. By faith in Christ's work on the cross, I died with Christ and died to the power of sin. I was raised with Christ to walk in the newness of life. I am set by God on a sure path of being conformed into the image of Christ, though I will stumble. I will not utterly fall. My old life has passed away, and I'm a new person in Christ because who I am positionally. I am united with Christ. I am bought by the Lord at a great cost. God is working all things for my eternal good and his glory, and Jesus is coming back, and it's nearer now than when I first believed. Those are some of the, the, the gospel truths that we can rehearse, even on a daily basis. Uh, I would even encourage you to 
uh, memorize Titus 2, 11 through 14. And you can just meditate on that. It's, it's the entire gospel. It's uh, salvation. Uh, then he gets to sanctification. It says putting off or training us uh, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And then he goes to uh, sanctification, what we're to put on. It says to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And then he gets to glorification when the Lord returns, waiting for our blessed hope. It's the whole thing right there. You can meditate on that when you wake up in the morning, uh, when you drive, when you're studying, when you're walking from classes. Uh, and it's, it's meditating on the truths of Christ, what he's accomplished for us, what he's going to do as well in his soon return. So vivify uh, the truths of Christ daily. Exercise our faith in trials is the next point. Uh, where we take the truths and we, we pray them into action. And we take steps. When we're thinking right, it warms up our affections to want to do what's right, which then strengthens our resolve to do what's right. So it starts with the thoughts. And our thoughts are renewed with Scripture. It, they warm up our affections that we want to please the Lord, we want to hate sin, and it strengthens our resolve to then do, by the, the help of the Spirit of God, to do what pleases Christ. So our, our cognition, our affections, and our volition, the three aspects of our heart, are all uh, affected by the Spirit of God using His Word. So make exercise of our faith in trials and in the battle against sin. Uh, letter D, uh, vivify walking by the Spirit. Uh, I found it interesting in the first seven chapters of Romans, the Holy Spirit's mentioned three times with regards to salvation, taking the work of Christ and redeeming us, uh, applying Christ's finished work to our lives, born of the Spirit. So three times in seven chapters, the Holy Spirit's mentioned. When you round the corner of chapter 7, of, oh, wretched man, you know, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then chapter 8, verse 1, thanks be to God. You go into chapter 8, and how do we live this Christian life? The Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times in that one chapter. The Holy Spirit, it's by the Spirit, it's by the Spirit. You walk by the Spirit, by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the Lord. It, it's all by the Spirit. It is a dependent walk. Uh, how do I know if I'm just trying to do things in my flesh or I'm really depending on the Spirit? How much am I praying? How much of His Word am I taking in? Uh, how much of His Word is on my mind? That tells me how much the Spirit of God is involved. If I'm not praying, then I'm not dependent, uh, functionally speaking. So, Praying, you know, I, I, if I had prayed like that all the time and uh, throughout the day, I would pray without ceasing. And that's exactly right. We would pray without ceasing. So it's just prayerfully with the Spirit's words, the words of God in our mind, and doing His revealed will that's found in Scripture. So letting His Word dwell in us richly. Now that's going to be a challenge in our day and age, I don't know all of your lives, but I went on uh, Google and I did some just stat search, and I know that's uh, always iffy when you get into statistics. But I did find it interesting. Uh, Lifeway, the Southern Baptist uh, research group, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, came out with some statistics on uh, church attending people in evangelical churches. And here were some of the statistics. Uh, 45% read the Bible at least once a week. 45% of the people read the Bible once a week. Only 20% of the 45 read the Bible every day. Then 40% of these regular church-going people read the Bible once or twice a month. And then 20% never read the Bible, but they go to church regularly. And that's pretty sad when only 20% read the Bible every day, and we don't even know what that entails. That could be a proverb a day. 
But when you go to social media stats and TV watching stats, the average adult view, uh, is on social media two hours a day. Teenagers are up to nine hours a day on social media. TV watching, the average adult watches TV five hours, and it says four minutes. Uh, five hours, four minutes. Teenagers, it could vary between three hours to seven hours of TV. Now just, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The word of God is to have an intoxicating effect on our minds. Our, we ought to be under the dominating control of God's revealed will, his word. If we're only reading it a few minutes a day, but we're hours and hours either watching TV or social media, you can tell what is going to dominate and influence our minds. And again, omission Omission of the scriptures will lead to commission of sin. And not just the hearing of God's word, but the practice of it as well. So just the stats are alarming in our day and age. Letter E there uh, on your notes, uh, vivify a focus on specific righteous alternatives to your sin. Again, we're not into breaking habits, we're in replacing them. So if someone's lusting, the opposite is not get married. That's not the solution to lust. Repentance and faith in Christ and putting on sacrificial Christ-like love is the opposite of lust. People say, oh, I'm lusting, I need to get married. No, you'll just use your spouse as an object uh, to satisfy yourself. The, it's repentance and faith and pursuing a Christ-like alternative. Lust, the opposite would be sacrificial Christ-like love. Uh, other things would be like, uh, there's confusion. I'm just so confused on gender. The opposite, repent by faith in Christ. Start learning what is sure and steadfast. Uh, what is certain and authoritative is God's word. That'll bring clarity to where there's confusion today. Where there's pride, we replace it by God's spirit and putting on Christ-like humility. Now, let's go in the, the time we have. I know time is... Quickly fleeting here, letter D, where the rubber meets the road. This is like 30,000 feet uh, to sea level. So like a crime scene investigation. You see a crime uh, in very popular shows on TV, <clears throat> and then they get into the details, uh, the garments, uh, a piece of hair. They get into real detailed. We ought to think in a detailed way looking at a crime scene. Well, every sin we commit is a crime. Uh, maybe CSI would be careful sin uh, investigation. Let's just take a look at what are we doing, what are we thinking, wh what provisions are we making, where are we omitting uh, the disciplines of grace. We ought to do a crime scene investigation on our sin and sin habits. Don't just say, oh, Lord, just take it away. But let's, with the help of the Spirit of God, really do a crime scene investigation. What am I surrounding myself with? Who are my friends? How much time and am I taking God's word and meditating on it into action and, and really look at how did I get to where I'm at? And then taking the specific steps. So first of all, personal hindrances uh, to growing in our faith. And I, I mentioned all of these in the book, so I won't take the time to go through them. Um, but are several things that will hinder us uh, in a walk of faith. Uh, obviously, number one, if you're unsaved. But laziness, ignorance of theology, bad company, uh, they will hinder us. It will take us away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, as 2 uh, Corinthians 11, verse 3 says. Uh, Satan is going to use the world uh, himself, uh, luring as well as our flesh, to, to take us away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So hindrances. Then number two, specific exercises that help us change and, and revive our, quote, little faith to maybe greater faith, uh, faith that's exercised. Uh, number one, examine yourself periodically. The Puritans call this self-judging. Only do it periodically. 
And I put a footnote, a good quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book, Spiritual Depression, which can be really helpful there, not getting morbidly introspective. Letter B, slow down to meditate on the truths of Christ every day. As I mentioned, I, I would encourage you, memorizing Titus 2, 11 through 14, even Romans 13, 11 through 14. So there's two 11 through 14s, Romans 13 and Titus 2. Just meditating on these truths of the gospel of Christ. Uh, letter C, confess your sin specifically to God, and if you've sinned against another person, confessing to them. Now, confession doesn't mean just say the same thing, and that's it. Confession has built in that word also a forsaking. I sinned in this way, this is what I need to do instead, and I'm going to make plans and steps to, to put on what's right. Now, this is not Roman Catholic confession, and next week you do the same thing. This is taking steps to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Have a plan to turn uh, from it to pursue Christ-likeness. Uh, letter D there in your notes and letter J are similar. Have a plan, a battle plan. I, I was interested... Uh, uh, Several um, months ago, I was uh, at a, a high school. There was a conference going on, and the green room was the sports room. We, the speakers were hanging out in a sports room. It was on a Saturday. Uh, they had played a football game at the high school the night before. And I was sitting there, and I saw a big stack of papers, and they were trash. <clears throat> I didn't know what it was. I just went over and started looking at it, and it was a whole spreadsheet about six pages long, front and back, of the opposing team, uh, the football team, that this high school uh, team would play the night uh, previous. And in this, this is stats. It was know your, uh, the opposing team. Everything about that team, whenever they had the ball, and I mean, it is broken down when they are uh, anywhere from uh, the zero to 20 yard line, uh, and they have second down and four to seven yards to go. This is typically what that team calls. And all, every scenario you can imagine that they've watched and done stat studies on a team, and this was a game, one game. And they went to all that work training their team. I believe they lost, that high school lost to the, the team on Friday night. But what are we doing with our own habits, sin habits? And we need to take the time to evaluate and make a plan. And I have a suggested plan in the book on killing sin habits. And very quickly here as I'm wrapping up this time, uh, making sure no provisions are made for your flesh as the scripture says, a thought journal. That, that's going to be the, the key point to, to deal with. As Ralph Venning says in his book on uh, the sinfulness of sin, uh, thoughts are the firstborn of the soul. Words and actions are only younger brothers. I mean, he just goes right after the thoughts. They are the mother sins. Actions being their issue, the, the fruit. Go after the thoughts. What was I thinking? What was I not thinking I should have been thinking? And there's a thought journal in your notes that you can take a thought, write it down, and then work it through scripturally, following a pattern in Philippians 4 that can help you renew your mind one thought at a time. You don't renew your mind all at once. You renew your mind one thought at a time. And be intentional. Uh, include accountability, someone who can come alongside of you, another godly individual. This is Hebrews 3.13. Exhort one another every day just because of the deceitfulness and uh, hardness of sin in our lives. And then actively, letter K there, actively and specifically pursue loving other people. Uh, it's to get our mind off of ourself, uh, loving God, loving others, and they are inseparable, those two, loving God and loving others. And then making specific commitments, some resolutions that you have listed there in your notes of, that will help you take action steps uh, to mortify sin in your life and revive 
and exercise faith in Christ. Uh, I also had some Puritan quotes in your notes. A uh, couple there from John Owen, uh, also Christopher Love, that are very helpful about setting our faith at work on Christ for the killing of our sin. And uh, a, a mortified believer is a warrior. Uh, you're not playing with sin, you are fighting it with the help of the Spirit of God. So let me just close here with reading these two passages. Besides this, this is Romans 13, 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Be aware, Christ is returning sooner now than it was. Wake up and walk with Christ. And then lastly there, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. May God use his word, the principles, the commands of it by the Spirit to encourage you this day uh, to mortify by the Spirit the deeds of the flesh and by the Spirit to revive, awaken, your faith, and exercise it in the Lord Jesus Christ to his glory and forevermore.